Um, let's turn to Melissa, who has uh, been very active with uh, the Founders Live group and with the Korean Company Showcase and uh, helping a lot of companies make progress with how they tell their story. Um, one of the terrible things about angel investing is that you get 30 companies that come and pitch, of which you remember like two or three. And sometimes you remember one, which is really an amalgam of the three that you sort of remember because things didn't stand out. And so perhaps Melissa is going to dive into helping us understand how to remember all of you. Melissa, if you would uh, introduce yourself a little bit and then yeah. dive right in. Yes, thank you so much. My phone just went off, so I kind of I just jumped. Um, thank you, John. It's always a pleasure to see you and and welcome everyone. I am really looking forward. This is my favorite subject in the world, is to talk about storytelling and business. Um, so uh, let's see. I should probably share my screen because I'm going to have some some slides, but. Um, I really enjoy that a few of you know some of my past clients, and some of you have been clients either through Founders Live or uh, Seattle U or SAC, um, so it's great to see you all, okay? So I'm going to share my screen real quick, uh, and I'm going to do a lot of storytelling tonight, honestly, um, and breaking things down and sharing case studies that I did with other clients. Um, here we go. Can you see my screen? That's me as a redhead. <laughs> which dramatically changed accidentally last week. So I have new headshots coming, but yes, I am now going to be blonde. Um, so I'll just give a little background of who I am, just so you can kind of get an idea of the work I do. So I, uh, I am a storyteller. I actually get up on stages like The Moth and, and podcasts, and I tell personal stories. So I am constantly throwing my own vulnerabilities out there on stages to themes that are thrown out there because I'm an artist at that, at that point. At the same time, I'm also a business person. I'm an entrepreneur. I was in 20 years in ad tech and enterprise sales. So I know the world of what it's like to go through quite the process to get people to hear your story and say, yeah, I like that. That makes sense to me. Um, over here, you can see I am Founders Live. And then these are, I'm also the pitch coach for the Seattle University's business plan competition for the last three years, which is where this really started for me. I was standing there at the pitch competition in 2018. And as I'm standing there in this lobby, there's, you know, hundreds of angel investors there to see what the big idea is going to be. And I just kept seeing the same presentation pretty much over and over. It was the problem and, you know, a slide with a bunch of words on it. And then the solution, and there was a bunch of words and graphs and, and sentences and, and whatnot. And I noticed there was no story. There was nothing emotionally connecting me to what that problem that they were solving was about. Because what I love, 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 love about entrepreneurs is that you get up every morning and you're going to change the world. You're either fixing something that's broken or you're adding on to something that's ready for expansion or you've come up with something that no one's ever thought about. I mean, those are the three buckets that I put them in and I love every single one of them. And all of your presentations, the entire deck that you're doing is a story. So, you're, so the, the stories that you tell and the slides that you show are going to be backing up the entire big story. So I'm going to get into that tonight too. I'm going to kind of break down some things of what I would ask you not to do when you're doing a presentation. And also to keep in mind that your oratory presentation and the slides that go with that are not necessarily the same slides that you leave behind. And oftentimes that's one of the biggest mistakes I see out of the gate is I see these slides and there's just all this information on there and your listener is just going to get overwhelmed and not know where to go with it. And so it's up to you as the storyteller, the presenter, however you want to call it. I, I consider you the storyteller in that you have tremendous power as the speaker, which means you also have tremendous obligation. And so what you're doing when you're creating the narrative in your presentations is you're creating what I call the mind movie. And so you need to pull us in to your story, to your characters who are having this problem that are relatable to human beings using your product or using your service. And now we have somewhere to go with it. 
Okay, so I'm going to get into that a little bit more, but that's kind of the basis of what story fruition, what I do every single day with clients like you're seeing up here on the screen. I also, uh, my filmmaker that wanted something, I'm, I, uh, I'm also an advocate for storytelling through a, a show that I do called Melanin Stories Matter, and that's where we use storytelling for um, advocacy, for uh, presenting voices of uh, the BIPOC communities. Uh, to be heard and so that we can all start to think and act better. So storytelling is powerful in business, it's powerful in personal, it's powerful in dating. I mean, learn storytelling skills because you're just going to be that much more compelling at any cocktail party that you ever go to. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Um, the story fruition, so I call this the story fruition. I'm actually working on my book. I'm almost through the first draft and really one of the stories that every entrepreneur needs to tell is how did you get into this? You know, like what is it that happened along your path in life that brought you to where you are today? I heard a lot of different businesses, you know, from, from, sea, from sea, uh, seafood to neurocritical care, um, mobile apps. There's, you're doing a lot. And that is an interesting story to tell, especially like if you're on a podcast, you know, if anyone here is wanting to be on this podcast, because it's a great way to scale the awareness of what you're doing. And they ask you, so how'd you get into this? Can you answer it? Or do you just kind of meander around because you're not really sure how to say it, or you just start doing your resume off LinkedIn? Um, that's not really what they want. They really want to have an understanding of who you are as the leader. Show your vulnerability, show moments in your life that like had an impression on you. And now it all makes sense because 30 years later, those stories can be pieced together to come up with a really amazing two to three minute story that you can tell on a podcast. The founder story or the story fruition, it's also a story that as you grow, you know, your salespeople are going to tell that story. Your marketing people are going to tell that story. So there's a few core stories that I, I zoom in on really fast when I'm working with people because we need to understand it. Um, so that's, that's kind of a little bit about that. And the why. Why, sh why should we even bother telling stories? Like I know that in business, and I worked with John last week where we were working with 15, it was like 12, it started off with 15, we had 12 Korean businesses that are coming into the United States. And every single deck that I saw at the beginning was completely data. It was all data, 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 data. And we had to help them uh, formulate a story that would make it more palatable to the mind when they were telling that story. Because a narrative is what John was alluding to is like, you know, we had a bunch of people there and there was like maybe two or three that we could remember. Guess what they remembered? They remembered the story of the brand more than any pie chart. That's what I say. It's like, there's no graph or pie chart that is really going to be the thing that they're going to walk away with. They're going to walk away with the, the narrative that you're tying to it. So it helps you engage, it helps you connect, and it helps you take emotion and put it into your deck. So throughout this, this presentation, I'm going to share very specific case studies of how that happened and what those results were. Um, I can even start with Pradnia Desh. A couple of you have mentioned that you have seen Pradnia's pitch or you have heard about Pradnia's pitch. Pradnia came to Founders Live in, I want to say, May of 2020. And when she first came, she, Pradnia is a CEO that's creating something that hasn't been invented yet. She's one of those entrepreneurs and where her, her AI actually helps lawyers save time and money for the clients because they're not spending all this time and effort finding all the documents that are going to back up the contracts that they have to write, et cetera. And she, was, she had all of her data, all of her technology in place. She knew exactly how to explain it. But I said, well, did you ever have a client that just really made you realize that something was broken in the legal system? And she went, oh my God, yeah. I have Jen. Jen, and, and I, I think when it was like Evelyn, it's like, yeah. And I, well, tell me about it. And she was, oh, they were so sweet. They came in to our office and they needed to have two quotes. They needed to have some basic, uh, just LLC work and, and just getting the business set up. And that was like $4,000. And then they needed to have regulatory business because they were starting this cosmetic firm and they were, they were, they were vets for our company or for our country. 
And this was their dream to come true. They wanted to start this, this company, but they, they didn't have the 20 grand that we had to quote for the regulatory. And they proceeded to go on and then they got shut down within like six months and their dream just went away. And that's when I knew, I knew right then and there that this is broken and I, I can't let that keep going for people who deserve to have a dream. And so she started Advocat. That story is now being told several times and she opens with it. And we have like a soldier that's like looking at the, at the flag and she tells the story of those two women and how that was an injustice to them. So those are the sort of things that I try to look for when I'm working and when I'm, and when I'm watching any kind of presentation, okay? Kind of, kind of touched on this, you know, the problem and the solution. So I'm, I'm trying to reposition the way that that is done. And it's been commonly taught. You write the words, the problem, and you put a bunch of data in there. But this is what's happening with the brain. The left brain, the analytics, the data, the stuff that makes us logically make decisions that we have to do, especially when we're considering investing in a company, you have to have that. Like, what are the projections? What's the, what's the cap table? What's the, what's the, the addressable market? That's got to be there. But if you start there, it's about like 5% of the brain gets engaged. Because what's happening is, is you're, you're putting a slide up. And as the storyteller, remember I said, whatever you put in front of me to look at, you're asking me to kind of stop listening to you to some degree. So if you put a bunch of stuff up on a screen, notice my slides are really clean, right? Because I want you to listen to me. So the left brain's kind of looking at the graph. It's looking at the numbers. It's got Y and X and it's kind of, kind of absorbing, but it's not really hooked. When you add that story, when you add human beings and you have emotions and you tell it in a way that the audience is like, oh, I know someone just like that. Oh my God, that reminds me of my mother. Oh yeah, I've done that a few times, you know, because they can relate to it. Now you're firing off hormones. You've got neuro, you've got like oxytocin. So for those of you who are in like sensitive healthcare or you're a nonprofit, you know, oxytocin is your hormone <laughs> because that opens up people's hearts. It gets people to want to give. Those are really important stories. But if you're doing something that's kind of, kind of wild and sexy and cool and, and fast, then you've got dopamine, serotonin. Those are all coming in. But that's what storytelling does. It literally sparks the brain. And when you get people listening to you and getting into it, they're leaning in. They're not looking at their phone right? They're, they they kind of want to, we love stories. Human beings love stories. We've been telling them since the beginning of time to explain why the sun goes up and the moon goes down, or right? Sun goes down, the moon goes up, you know. <laughs> so we love stories as human beings, and that's why we honestly embrace them. But how do you tell a great story, right? That's, that's the next puzzle. I think we agree, like, stories are, are helpful, but how do you tell them? And that's where, honestly, my workshops get into that a little bit more, because as a storyteller, and you're creating this mind movie, you need to have an arc. You need to have the client or the problem, the person who's going to be experiencing the problem in one state of mind. And when you come in as the hero of, the, of, this, of this problem, you're transforming them to a new state of mind. So you're solving the problem. So you're the hero in your entire deck. I'm gonna, this is a real life example of, a, of an event that I had. I think Tom, you've probably heard me tell this story, but it just, I think it's an oldie, but a goodie. And as I'm telling this story, I want you to pay attention to some of the things that I am doing. And this is a longer story, but I, I'm gonna be doing things because I want you to have a mind movie with me, all right? So I am in a conference room at a nice hotel in Bellevue, and there's a couple hundred angel investors in there. Sound familiar? And there's going to be 10 speakers that day, and they, have, they, they are on the circuit. They are going to be per performing their presentations, and there's going to be a lot of questions asked of them, and the stakes are really, really high. And we're gathering around, you know, we're getting our lunches and saying hello to each other, and we have our booklets and we can see where, you know, the companies and what they're doing are. And I look over there and I see this giant guy in the back. He's huge. He's like a Kodiak bear. He's wearing like a silver jacket and he's got a speaker badge on. And I see that he's actually solving problems for ovarian cancer. Like, 
that's amazing, right? So I, I go up and I introduce myself and I said, hi, I just, you know, I'm Melissa Reeves. I, I just want to wish you luck today. And he's like, oh, thanks. Um, what do you do? I'm a storytelling coach. Oh God. <laughs> like, bing! He just shot out. Like he could not get away from me faster. He goes, you're going to hate what I do. I'm like, well, just relax. It'll be okay. Clearly he was someone that loved to solve these complex problems, like being in the lab, looking at the charts, analyzing the data was absolutely his, his wheelhouse, right? But getting up in front of people, a lot of CEOs in the science world find themselves in that. And he did not like that. When he got up to be the presenter, they introduced him. He then reintrodu reintroduced himself, which I don't believe you need to do, especially when you're doing like a minute pitch. If they've already introduced you, do not waste your time reintroducing yourself. Um, and then what he did was he, he started off with this, a giant rat on the screen. I remember we're eating our lunches. And he had behind it, this giant rat that had a, like a tumor of the size of a baby on its thigh. And then it had a whole bunch of black and white reversed graphs with lots of percentiles and decimal points. And it was just like, there was a lot. And it was kind of what I would say, it was this moment where I went, ooh, that's a bit of a swing and a miss because he dove right into the data. We had no relationship with the company. We didn't really know what they were doing other than we saw that this rat had this giant tumor. I'm trying to eat our lunch room like, ooh. okay. There could have been another way that we could have approached that, all right? So what if he had come in with a real woman that he's served? Because as, as a doctor, as a genius doctor, you know that he has met many, many, many patients that have touched his heart, right? We don't know who it is. It could be a neighbor, could just be a patient, could be a relative. And we in the audience may know someone who also had that type of diagnosis or a cancer diagnosis. So it's a very oxytocin relatable story that could be the thing that warms you up to prime the audience about what you're gonna do to solve a very, very serious problem, all right? That's what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, we wanna transform this person, right? From, from nervous, terrified to excited, calm. These are some of the words that we use when we are starting opening stories. It's like, where is your audience? Who is your audience? Who's your target audience? And what's the typical state of mind that they're in before they know who you are? So think about that, write that down even. Like what is your customer's state of mind typically? Where are they at emotionally? And how are you going to transform that? Where do you wanna head them in this presentation? And the data is going to come in there and prove that you can do it. That's what the data does. It proves it. All right. So if we took another stab at the, at the Dr. Data story, you know, here we have Sarah. She's 42 years old. She has two kids. She's a soccer mom. And she's about ready to pick them up for, from a game when she gets a call from the doctor who is telling her, look, you have a very aggressive stage two of ovarian cancer. She cannot believe what she's hearing. What does that mean to me, doctor? So you can put in dialogue. Um, well, it could say that we, you know, we're gonna have to increase your medicines quite a bit. And when you come into the office, we're gonna need to look at radiation and chemotherapy options. Um, but we will have a tough road in front of us for the next few months. Sarah looks over at the Christmas tree and she sees the pine needles on the floor and she's realizing, I don't even know if I'm gonna see that next year. I'm terrified. Now we here at Pharma XYZ can now change that course for Sarah. Because of our work in ovarian cancer tumor reduction, we are now able to change that course so that Sarah isn't going to be going through the traditional long road that the doctor just explained to her. And here's how. And that's when he can like bring the rat up possibly bring the data in, you know, show the graphs, show the progress, and then start moving into the science of that industry, right? Like how many people are getting this? What is this addressable market? What is the death rate? 
when we have those little stories and that one was a little longer than I would normally possibly do, depending like if this was a 10 minute, I might spend the minute telling the story of Sarah, a minute and a half um, to move into the rest of the stuff because I want to emotionally grab you. And I want the audience to be like, oh my God, I know Sarah. Okay, that's that's what I'm I'm looking to help you with. I'm going to stop real quick if anyone has a question or I'm going to keep going. What should I do? Are there any questions? Questions? I have a question. Um, Melissa, are, are you going to talk to how to pack all this into one minute or three minutes? Because I love everything you're describing. And I feel like in a 20 or 30 minute podcast, I have a good feel for what that would look like. But when we're trying to now yep. pack it into such a tight amount of time. Yeah, I can absolutely address that. Okay, yeah, yeah, great. yeah. So, we'll, um, so, so it founders a lot. Well, let me get into a little bit more, and I'll come back to that. I don't know who was it that said that question. I just heard your voice, Kaylin. Sorry. Kaylin. Okay, <laughs> great, great, great. That's if fine. Yeah, any time. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a few uh, founders live victims that we had to do this in ninety nine seconds, and I definitely have a pattern. But we just have to reduce it quicker. You're, you're not going to have as much time in a minute. <laughs> but you will for three and you definitely will for 10. Okay. Uh, here's, here are some uh, use cases. So here is a tech company that, that we worked with where it's a very complex problem when you look at it from the data. Like when Rick Be Beaton was showing me all of the data that they have where they're helping HR um, take disparate pieces of information that are in multiple silos in all different places, they sometimes can't get their arms around why this person quit because they can't find where their, their, uh, their annual review is. They're sending out surveys, but they can't piece the survey response over to the review and it's a real mess. And his, his service actually brings it all in together into one dashboard. He was having a hard time figuring that out until we started with Joan, the HR director. Another person's just quit. And she has no idea where to find it. So we have an image of, of the HR professional. He starts the story and he sets up what he's doing. And he did that within probably 30 seconds. Quite honestly, in the 99s, if we don't have the story done in 25 seconds, it's too long. Okay. So we have to, we have to bring it, we have to be really concise. I personally love time restraints. Because time restraints are going to cause you to have to be very precise with the words you choose and the images you show, right? 10 minutes, people can ramble. You got to be pretty disciplined, but you can expand on stuff, which is the luxury of it. But these three minute, these two minute, 99s, whatever, those, those are the ones that you, your precision matters the most on that. So take a look at like when you have a minute, Take that and go, okay, at 20 seconds, and now I've got 40 seconds, and I've got to show the problem, or I've got, you know, I've got to iterate how we're solving that problem very quickly and how fast we're going to do it. That might be one way of looking at it, but it's got a beginning, the middle, and then the ask at the end. Um, it's like a little mini story. Uh, you're the hero. So again, this is just, these are just a slew of few Founders Live people that we've had. They, they did it in 99 seconds and every single one of them always says to me, what, how am I gonna change the world in 99 seconds? I'm like, you're gonna do it. I've only had three people not hit their time in my year and a half of doing it. The first one, the guy didn't show up for the rehearsals. The second one, um, his mom was in the audience and he just went on a little, <laughs> just went on a little long and lost track of time. And then the third one lost track of time only because we went from a virtual world to a live world just last month. And I think the energy of the room changed it, which is also something to think about. Those are two different meeting rooms, right? So you have a little more control, if you will, in its virtual because it's quieter. But when you get into those live, when we come back and we get to stay back in 3D, it's another thing to think about as the storyteller and the presenter that you have to be ready that there's an energy of human beings that are gonna be around you. And if you are being timed, rehearse as if you're in that audience right now, because you don't wanna be surprised like my friend did last month. He was like, oh, it just threw me. I just didn't think about that. It still did get a great presentation, but it was just, it threw him a little bit, okay? Um, 
education. A lot of times what I'm seeing is, a, is entrepreneurs will come in and because there's something in storytelling that we call the power of knowledge, meaning that you know what a food allergy is about because you've lived them. Don't assume that we all know it. So when you're presenting something, you can do a tiny, tiny little story that will show us what a, uh, a food allergy is like. So New Flowers Bakery is wonderful. Phoebe uh, Rossi, I think, is in this program. Um, we worked together to help her with her presentation because it was a lot of data, data, data. And during the meeting, I was like, what's it like? Like, I don't have any allergies. So what's it like if you have a soy allergy? And she proceeds to tell me, like, it's it's hell. Like, it, the cramping, skin rashes, um, bloating, just you, just, you can get knocked out from just eating the wrong soy sauce at, at, a, at a restaurant. And she said to me, walking into it, when you have a lot of food allergies, like gluten and things like that, one, you're the last one to get picked to come to the party because everyone thinks you're a pain. So it's really lonely sometimes. And two, um, uh, it's like going into a landmine when you're going into a restaurant. You have really no idea, even alcohol, if it's not an organic grown, it could, it could hurt somebody. So it's really difficult. That was not in her presentation. It was all about like, we use gluten-free, we use all these products and she does all this incredible ethical, wonderful work. Like she makes sure that the footprint, the carbon footprint is, is, is reasonable. Um, she only has two ingredients that she has to get from across the planet, but that means that she's gonna make sure the eggs near her are, are happy chickens eating happy food and that they are nearby. Right. So she's she's got a lot of and she's also a female. So some of her data is that we are female, 85% uh, female run. And we are also very heavily into BIPOC community. Right. Those are data points in her presentation that explains the characteristics of her company. And so we can do that with images. So throughout her deck, we had tiny little stories like, you know, uh, Jeremy, we had like a guy that had a soy allergy. We had a gluten free and we had a peanut allergy story. They were 10 seconds long. Jenny just ate a cupcake that had peanut in it and her, she's now got to use her EpiPen to make sure she doesn't pass out. Boom, done. Next one. You know, so she just had these little characters and we had a picture of a girl eating cupcake and she's kind of crying because pictures say a thousand words. One of my favorite tools when I'm working with a client is when we start opening up, ask Tom Thomas, when we start opening up my Adobe stock photos. <laughs> because once I understand who it is that we're going to get, I'm going to go retrieve an image for you, or you need to retrieve an image for yourself to have those pictures of, of those people. So it's a great investment to have um, because it can also save you time, right? So if you have a nice picture and you've only got a minute, the picture is going to say things for you, right? They're going to say things for you that your mouth can't say and doesn't have to because the picture's saying it. So you should be making sure that your slides are telling the story and supporting you and not upstaging you. So when you throw a slide at me with a lot of data, it upstages you. And if it upstages you, you just took the train off the tracks. That's how I always try to explain it. So I'm like, you want to keep the train on the attention tracks and that's you. You're the conductor. Had a gentleman uh, in one of my meetings, he does um, tech payments, okay? And he's very data oriented. Um, he's, a, he's a wonderful human being. He's, he's in the, uh, the army reserves. He serves our country still. And he has an, an incredible payment process, which during COVID we've learned. So when he's looking at this graph, he shows us this graph. He's showing us all the data of like how great sales are for his company. And then he goes, see that? Points to it. You know what that is? COVID. And then he goes on. And I'm like, oh, that was good. That was the teaser of the story. Come on, let, let's expand on that. So you could actually go see that. That's May 2020. That's when we were all wearing uh, rubber gloves and being corralled at Costco because we didn't know if we could touch our carts yet. We were washing the bags of our groceries before we even came into our house. We left our homes only for necessity because we were terrified of the COVID. We didn't even understand what it was. And we stopped spending. We stopped going to bars. We stopped going to restaurants. We stopped. And then we started to figure it out because human beings are resilient. And we started realizing, oh, I can buy things, but they can come to my house. And then sales started to come back up. And they started to come back up faster and faster and faster. And now we're back on track. That's a story 
that explains that data point a lot more vividly. Because when he was in his world, he, he had to transfer also, like, because, you know, usually you're handing your credit card, they take the credit card, not during COVID, right? So he was getting touchless technology. So he was expanding his own business very quickly to help. So there's a story. So look for your stories in the graphs. Bright side. I got a call from the CEO, Tom, uh, Tom Spann. He actually was the CEO of Accolade in, um, in Bellevue, if any of you have heard of them, and they essentially would help people. In, it's a business to business uh, uh, solution for HR to offer to their employees about um, if they have health issues, health insurance fights that they're trying to solve, Accolade will go in as one of their services to help people. Well, he started a second company called Brightside. And he calls me up and he, and he, he had seen me, I, I'm also an improviser and he'd seen me act and he'd seen me do some of this stuff. And, and he said, Melissa, I'm getting ready for Andreessen Horowitz. Okay, we're ready. Got the deck. I know it. I've got the numbers. It's amazing. It has no heart. What do I do? Tom, you have three amazing oxytocin ridden case studies that we found over the summer. And we did. And he's like, oh my God, you mean I should be putting those into my deck? I'm like, yeah. Absolutely. And so he did. And so in this case, we had this story where we had, you know, here's Jenny. She's got two little kids under five. Boom. Show Jenny, right? And Jenny can't make ends meet because she is got a $600 daycare. She's a single mom with a $600 daycare fee. This is a true story. And so she's running around at night with her kids in the back of her car. Little squirrels are in the back of the car and she's driving and delivering Uber Eats on top of her day job at this communications company. Okay, not ideal. Then her car gets stolen. So her next idea is, I'm gonna keep my little squirrels up all night until they fall asleep, and then I'm gonna sneak off to work and hope that they don't need me. Really not a great idea. And she got run down. She was just falling apart. And her manager called her in and they said, okay, we're gonna help you with this. This is not an ideal thing. So we're gonna bring in Brightside. And Brightside came in and immediately was able to negotiate a uh, lower credit card payment, just consolidated all her bills. And they even got her daycare bill of $600 down to 150 bucks. They changed her life, right? And so he now had these case studies. Case studies are really important stories. They're not just, they use this drug and then this was the, the decibel point improvement. Put the human beings behind your case studies so that people can go, oh my God, that was amazing. And this is what happened for Tom. He closed $35 million and he attributes adding those stories into his deck. I mean, of course, not just us, but like part of the work that he, he said he did, he goes, I had to have those stories in there and that really, he could see them leaning in. So someone said earlier tonight, stories sell. Yep, <laughs> they do. And your pitch deck is a big pitch story sale. So I hope this is resonating. Um, Chris Jones is a CFO of a military uh, company that makes components for uh, our naval ships and our, our, our aircraft. And Chris, during one of my workshops, we were trying to find like, what's a moment that's connected to you and this company? And they were having a revolving door problem at the time where a lot of people were quitting. And so he went on as the new CFO, he went onto the floor of the plant to see and meet the people. And as he was sitting there, he saw this woman, we called her Edna, we named her Edna, and she was sitting there on a pillow, and she had this big giant magnifying glass in front of her, and she's got solder glasses on, and she's, she's like a surgeon, fixing and, and making this cable work. I mean, she is like a surgeon. When it dawned on him that that very cable that Edna was working on were the same cables that 25 years ago when he was in the Navy working on those aircraft carriers that had 75,000 people on, that those cables were the ones that acted like the central nervous system to those airplanes. And suddenly he said, I'm back here in Edna or where am I? I'm in Green River, like Blue Mountain, Minnesota. And he's realizing that 
those cables are saving lives for our military. And now he had like this incredible, like heartfelt connection to the work that he was doing. And he told that story to the boardroom because he's had to make the point that Edna needed better goggles. They needed to improve the goggle situation. And the board was like, oh my God, we didn't even realize that that was a problem until he went in and told that story. So there's a lot of different shifting things that we can do when you start to realize the power of your storytelling skills. So know your characters, know their problem, feel their emotions. In the workshops I teach, I really get into like sensory work, you know, the smells, the sights, the sounds. I did that with Dr. Data. With Dr. Data, I had, um, he went, ping! He got out of there as fast as he could. Just that little sound makes a little cartoon moment because you kind of want to like make it entertaining. But then when I had Sarah looking over at the pine, at the Christmas tree, some of you may have smelled it, right? Looking at the pine needles. That, I see Raj is shaking his head. Little details like that are adding to the, 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 the dimensions of your stories. That's what's increasing that, that emotional. So it could just be little stuff, little stuff that you can do that can change the mind movie and, and invoke that emotion that you want from them. Okay. What I would like you to be very conscientious of is now looking at your slides. So during um, one of our uh, uh, Korean businesses, I was seeing a lot of slides like this. Now this isn't the worst slide I've ever seen. And as a leave behind, it may not be bad, but when you're in an oratory and you've only got 99 seconds or you've only got three minutes, what's happening to me? I am looking at big words, epidemic logical. <laughs> Uh, I got something over here with GeoHiker over here. Uh, I got three computer screens that I can't really read and see what they're about. I've got the, the, I guess, the client. And then I've got 24 hours and 10 minutes after and something about tracing analysis. As soon as they put that slide up, I was out listening because I was like, what am I looking at? What is that? What am I looking at? Oh, I can't even tell what that is. And as I'm doing that and the rest of the audience is doing it too, you took the training. So this was what the, the slide ended up looking like, okay? We found this really cool, because their story was amazing. They actually do uh, spatial temporal date, big data. And so this is, this is movement and events and, and, and they had done um, you know, elevation, your phone moves around, that's data that needs to be captured. And they take all these pieces of information and then they can, they can find huge solutions. So in South Korea, when COVID first hit, they were, if you remember, they were getting some attention for, getting it kind of in control a lot earlier than everyone else. And what was happening was when someone was di diagnosed with COVID, they, the government had to go and find where that person had been. And it took each person 24 hours for them to locate. They were at this restaurant. They were over here at this place. They saw they were on the subway. Now all these things need to be notified. They need to be cleaned 24 hours per person. They use this new, this new technology that she sets up earlier in her presentation called GeoHiker and shows how they were able to detect it. And they took the 24 hours and brought it down to 10 minutes per person. And they were able to you know, talk to them on their phones to be able to talk faster. So it was like super impressive. But this slide and this slide were different. Notice how we have like the COVID floating around the heads. That's what I'm trying to talk about. We've got a busy city. We've got lots of people. We're in the city. There's people talking and there's some COVID. It's kind of creepy, right? And then we just did the numbers, all that we needed in that particular, in that particular story. So choose your numbers carefully and use the best numbers to tell the story that you're threading throughout your deck. And you might have lots of different stories is what I'm saying. Here's another one. We had a, we had a company that's doing smart baby um, products. So innovation, someone was talking about innovation. Uh, they have a smart um, uh, baby bottle. They have a temperature check and they have a smart uh, diaper. Like, so what they're doing is they're tracking the patterns of the child for especially these tech savvy young parents. But this data is really powerful and 
and companies like Boston Children's Hospital want to use this data so that they can they can make smarter decisions about patterns in certain you know conditions that babies might be having, infants, etc. And when he first brought his deck, it was just pie chart, pie chart, pie chart, pie chart, pie chart. It was just a lot of stuff going on. And he loved babies. And I'm like, we love babies. So show me how, like, what makes a baby grumpy? And how does your, how does your, your, uh, your, your bottle work? And so this slide right here is great in many ways because I like to say, have your slide be able to be read without making me have to read it. Does that make sense? So if you have a ton of sentences that you're making me read, you took me out and that's on you. But this, the numbers, so now he's telling the story. He's like 52% of the time that a baby's upset is that they're very hungry and young parents don't need to, or young parents don't understand when those times are in the data, the most frequent for this baby. So he had little Alex, right? And then he tells the story of like, now Alex knows that the um, that 1 p.m. tends to be a very consistent time and the baby bottle actually starts to prep, prep the milk uh, ahead of time for the mother to use, all right? So he's just taking little pieces of data, adding a little story, having little Alex and his mom using the product. Do you think I'd love this slide? <laughs> after what you've heard me say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was, this was presented in a, in a, in a quick pitch. And what happens? I mean, if anyone wants to chime in, you can unmute, but what happens when you see this slide? Come on, someone brave. <laughs> I go to sleep. Confusion. You're trying to race around to see all of the corners. To, what does it mean? Stop, mm -hmm. stop listening. Trying to follow the flow chart. Mm -hmm. I give up because they just didn't do the right job. I'm right. not going to try to extend myself to figure it out. He took the train off the tracks, didn't he? Yeah, I'm an investor. I'm looking for a reason to say no, and he just gave it to me. I want the next, you know, slide, the, the next deck. Right. So he, so, and here's another thing, and please hear me and write this down too, if you are someone that likes these kind of things, okay? If these are slides that you're thinking about your deck right now, you're like, uh-oh, <laughs> I've got a few of those. Again, it could possibly be a leave behind if they've already really walked through and asked a lot of questions and they get who you are, then this might work as a leave behind. I'm, you can see I'm not really completely convinced that it would um, because of what we just heard from the team, all right? But here's a, here's a way to do it. He was trying to show that, like, so what he was doing is he's actually taking data for restaurants because four out of five restaurants in the first five years go out of business. And they go out of business because they don't really use data to make smart business decisions. They, 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 the, 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 there's a sweet spot in, in restaurant um, in Korea in restaurant pricing that like 38% of the plate is the cost of the food. Then the rest of that is to keep the lights on, pay your staff, you know, like be able to run and operate your business. What they discovered was 48% was going towards the food costs. And so uh, that's not sustainable. And so companies are the restaurants who are serving their community, who have big dreams to just like have their food and have the, you know, the roar of laughter in their, in their restaurants every night, just evaporate because they weren't making data decisions. So his company goes in and through the POS system and the credit card system, they're able to see traffic times, they're able to see uh, popular dishes on what days, what are the costs, the prediction of, you know, it's turning colder, so the price of this food's gonna go up, you need to prepare for that. So the heart of what he wants to do is good, right? It's good. It's data, it's a data-driven industry, but most of the people working in it, running these companies, don't necessarily know that right away, all right? So he wants to fix that. So we changed the slide to look like this. Swipes the credit card, she's in front of the POS system, and there's a chart that shows the data. Now it's something that people can go, oh, okay, the picture, two of the pictures are saying the things he needed to say. And then the graph is showing the product in action. All right, now some of this was weird. I had to get with him. I'm like, what's 119,001? We had to convert some stuff. So we ignore that, please, because that was actually more Korean uh, numbers versus USD. Um, 
But the point is, is you see, it's like, oh, now I can show my graph, but I'm framing it in a way that it's palatable. I can absorb it. Okay. And then the simple ask slides, you know, I mean, again, anytime that there's a chart, uh, just make it clean and easy. Again, just clean and easy. I just, can I say that one more time? <laughs> make your slides, what? Clean and easy, right, okay? So that's it um, that I have prepared. And I'm, I'm more than happy to open it up. We can talk about sp specific questions. I can start to come back to Caitlin's question about like, how do you get the story into the, the one minute, three minute and 10 minute? I think I kind of, do you feel satisfied, Caitlin? Do you wanna like open your mic and do any further? Because like the Tom Span example was a 10 minute presentation and he had data data he, he would have a story and then data data story data data story mm -hmm. and then more like so he was peppering the graphs he was like and when we got to stories we went to those simple images mm -hmm. so you could have the balance of the right brain left brain working together okay. yeah i mean i've definitely found once i added uh more images and fewer words that 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 fits um I'm just thinking in, say you have the one minute or three minute, are you picturing a single narrative being threaded through with the rest of the information? Or are you kind of thinking about these kind of uh, relatable snapshots, but they're not necessarily a, a single narrative? That's a great question. And it's going to be individual to everybody, right? So I don't want to say there's a stock answer on that because it depends on what industry you're representing, the complexities of it. Um, I do believe that everyone should try to find a core story for their company to relate to, a persona that they're all shooting for and understanding. Um, and, and, and how you present that, you know, and how long you present it is, is the way that you're going to make your time, if you will. But like John's really clear, like he wants 20% on product and then the rest is on the business, but the product, but you got to have that problem set up. And um, like I said, you know, we did really short stories for new flowers, just so short. Here's Sarah. You know, I always, I always name him Sarah. I don't know why I default to Sarah. You don't know, you can name him whoever you want, but Sarah ate a peanut, uh, you know, uh, a cupcake that had peanut in it. And now her throat's closing up and she needs an EpiPen. Right. These are the people that we are here to help solve for. And then she goes into new flowers is a, is a gluten free vegan. Blah, blah, and she starts talking about um, the way she's approached. But we also went into her story in her longer presentation. So in her longer presentation, we have pictures of happy animals showing the sustainability um, values that they have. We had um, we have her own core story of her being a little girl at eight years old that can't go outside because she's out on a farmland and the winds are so bad that uh, it's blowing dust and she'll she'll go into an asthma fit. So, you know, another thing I wanna talk about with stories in your businesses is to develop a story library. So um, that's one of the things I have on here is that as you're growing, you know, you have your core story, your story fruition, if you will, your founder story, if you wanna call it that, you have your main characters that you're solving for, you have real case studies, you have partnership stories, you have um, data breakthrough stories, you have success, um, uh, uh, patent success stories. There's all these stories that you're going to have. And we actually put them into a digital library so that people can all learn the stories because you never know, especially your salespeople, salespeople in case studies, they are going to be your number one storytellers in your company really in so many ways in your C-suite um, and so in marketing. So they, they need to have like a library that they can go to. I was a salesperson for far too long. And when you're new and you don't know the, you don't know the product or the service very well, you're like aching for success stories and not just, they use this product and it went up 204% in ROI. That's not enough. They need to have an understanding of like the emotional val um, journey, if you will, that that company had before you came in and became the hero and saved the day. I think Raj has a question. Raj, do you have a question? I see your hand. Okay, you know, I'm gonna stop sharing real quick. Hang on, because I'd love to see the room now. Hi. Hey boss. 
I did. So, and I think it's kind of gone nonstop and I know there's this narrative and, and pretty specific, cool, 10 slides, solution problems. And I think you and I, it was tough for me to be robotic, um, but that paradigm has to be there in some way. Any best practices? And I, and I know John is very succinct and I know a lot of groups are, they're like, listen, you have X amount of time. I want to see these slides, get it done. Do you have some best practices to incorporate the panache into the decks at the same time while keeping status quo? It's a dichotomy that's really hard because it's hard for me just to get behind just the straight slides, understanding it's a tool that's very effective, right? Um, do you have some best practices of kind of incorporating the, like, like you, into that? Yeah. Well, I mean... You're right. You you have an obligation, especially in a pitch, right? You have to do the addressable market, the 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 the, the projections, your go to market, um, awards and accolades that you're having, your team, who's your team. You got to get all those things in because they're looking at you. And someone said earlier, I'm looking to poke the hole so that I can leave, right? Um, that's where I I still am going to just reiterate. Starting with a story as your problem to set it up gets people engaged. And then the rest of your deck, the slides just visually need to be simple and clean. And you can still have like, let's say, say you had, even if you had even a watermark, if you will, that's in the back of the, of like, let's say, let's say, let's say that the, let's go back to the COVID one with the little weird dots that were around it. Cause it was kind of a powerful image. Let's say that was the only product that they were going to talk about and that they wanted funding for that particular product. You could actually take that image and watermark it and have it be in the back where you're putting slide images of the, of the data stuff that they need on top of it. But it's artistically creative and it's still balancing and it's keeping in the minds what you're doing. Because we don't want them to forget what you're doing. And that's why images are really, really in my opinion, you know, an important part of, of delivering. So when they turn around, they'll be like, who was that story? You know, Detonic? Oh yeah, they're the ones, with, you know, with the, with the, uh, the COVID. And they'll just- it's like <laughs> pseudo right? subliminal message the entire time. Yeah, yeah. Love so it. so when you find that image, it's like pretty powerful to run with it. Especially if I can encapsulate kind of my problem that the whole we're working towards. Yep. And the people that are involved in it. And you're the hero. There, there are a bunch of different narratives besides a hero's journey. Mm -hmm. um, can you give people an alternative to the hero's journey so that they don't all look like the same Lord of the Rings sloshing through the rain kind of story again? Yeah, well, you know, I just, I, because the thing about storytelling that I like is I want, I want also for you to become an awesome storyteller everywhere right like you're in a one-to-one -one meeting and someone wants to ask you like so tell me some successes that you have formulaically that is a very easy formula to remember it's that the person's in one state of mind their life is like this think think star wars their life is like this everything's going fine and then something happens that blows up their life and that's causing the cause and effect problems for them and then you come in and you're able to address those problems so that they can then improve their life and carry on, okay? It's something like, but when we're telling stories, you know, there's like, and again, this would get more into a workshop that I'm teaching. I wanted to just kind of give an overview of storytelling and why and how to infuse it into your presentations and your boardroom meetings, you know, getting, getting underneath stuff, being vulnerable, creating characters that people can understand. Uh, but when I'm in a workshop, I actually get into like, the senses and the, the 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 voice, the dialogue. There's a whole bunch of stuff that helps you become like a master of storytelling. But and and again, and every time I'm saying storytelling, I can say presenter. You can just use the same word, right? Um, and the more you practice it, and if you have that a, a formula, it's pretty easy. You get better at it. Um, and that's why I do kind of default on that one. Is there a question? This is a, what? Did you know? Oh, wait, who's this? Wait. <laughs> that went away, sorry. I gotta look at the chat. I haven't been looking at the chat. Okay, well, John, like, why don't you expand on that? Let's talk about it. I'm not the only one with the answers. So the Jeffrey Moore um, 
value proposition is the shorter version of this. Mm -hmm. um, and people try to do a slide and talk about problem and then they try to talk about the solution and they try and they stretch the conversation out into five or 10 slides when in fact it can be just two or three sentences, right? Where you yeah. just quickly frame everything. And so here's a bunch of things that you need to know in your pitch. And you can thread characters and stories and benefits around this to make it go. But if you can't say this sentence without tripping over one of the little boxes that's not filled out, you don't have the information you need to tell your story. Because these are the critical you know, trees you have to turn around and the critical components of the story. They're the landscape that you play, plant the narrative into. And without that landscape being nailed down, then you end up, you know, letting us invent our own landscape, which is usually not to your benefit. Right. So you're saying that this this little formula here is is how the deck should unfold. Uh, well, I don't care about the order or structure of it particularly. I know Alliance of yeah. Angels and Crest do, um, but. I care that all of these points are addressed. Right. And okay. So yeah. if you have not figured out what's in the boxes and how those boxes relate to what other people are doing, then you're in trouble, right? Because you can't, you don't have the components you need to tell the story. Right. And so if you can go and fill this out, you know, uh, if you can take each of the little things in brackets and say the two or three words that fit into those brackets in a way that this sentence or set of sentences makes sense, now we can go tell a story and you have the vocabulary available mm -hmm. for you to build the story. I still mm -hmm. think you need to begin with, you know, the attention getting slide, which is, you know, somebody with blood running out of their face with a stick in their eye kind of feeling, not a, not a little gentle uh, um, uh, pie chart with pretty colors, but something that is like, pay attention to me now. Exactly. Now that you got my attention, mm -hmm. you got to tell me all the things that are in this paragraph. And if mm -hmm. you can't do those two things, then the three minutes have already gone by. And what was that you're saying again? Right, right. So like when we're in Founders Live, we, we're following that, like we set it up, but then we're, we're dropping in, we're slipping in business numbers throughout the, the entire presentation. Like we're, we're, yep. we're just be like, you know, and Sarah represents 50 million people that are spending $4.6 billion a year on this problem. So yeah, so we've got Sarah, she's got the problem and we're dropping in. Um, absolutely. You, that's, that's your obligation, right? But it's right. a little more fun to hear. It's not like, let me go show you the pie chart about the $4.6 billion, you know, completely. We've got Sarah involved in it and she's representing a huge audience. Yep. And uh, you have to make me feel for Sarah before you tell me about the big market. Yes, I, you need to care about Sarah because, and again, like, again, health sciences out there, those are so many people can relate. You know, we're getting a lot of companies that are, you know, solving problems due to COVID. Right, the, and we got to be careful, but those stories are going to be very emotionally charged. So the, the other thing that I want to make sure I bring up is that in our pitches, we'll do one minute, three minute, and 10 minute pitches. Maybe we'll do five minute, I don't know yet. But um, in those pitches, a lot of times people start with the same example, start with the same getting. You're going to see the same group of people three or four times, and you're going to start with the same you know, an engineer, an entrepreneur, and a penguin walked you into a bar, you're gonna tell the same joke over again, which we've already heard, and it's not funny the second time. Right. So Hopefully so people are yeah. evolving and they're telling different parts of the story each time, rather than telling the same story over and over in more gory detail each time. Right. Adding on to it. Well, that's again why it's like having multiple stories too. If you only have one story, you're like a one trick pony. That's why I was talking about the library and, and gathering. So every time you have a success with you, no matter where it is right now in your, in your beta, whatever, you have stories, record them, get them down, get, get, get them on paper, get them in a storyboard. Um, I want to show you, I was going to show you one. Um, hang on, Dr. Slide. 
There we go. If you give me a second, I'm going to show you one where. Uh, and if there's any questions while I'm finding this, I should find it pretty quickly. I want to pick on Caitlin. Pick on Caitlin, her. Caitlin's good at being picked on. Caitlin, you talk about brain injury and you do the blah, 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 brain injury, neuro, blah, 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 big word thingy, which I never remember. Can you tell us a little story about somebody that whacked their head and got uh, sideways with their life because of it? You good. Sure. This is David. He was a cyclist who was riding down the road one day and was hit by a car and everything about his life changed. His personality changed, he lost friends, he lost his job and it completely destroyed their lives. And he is now 10 years later, starting to put the pieces back together and trying to rebuild that. And had he been able to get access to a product like ours in the first few hours after that traumatic brain injury, he wouldn't have suffered the long-term damage that he currently lives with. Okay. Well, and all I want you to do is to add that little bit that Melissa said about how many Davids are there out there? Yeah. Yeah. That's the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you were like, if I was working with you and I would, I would add a little more like, but if you could, like if you were in your longer one, so like if we wanted to get to know David, say, you know, David was 40. I really like when we have the career, the age of the, of the character established because it puts everyone in a frame of mind of where they are in life. Right. Mm -hmm. Cause like a 30 year old's life is different than a 50 year old's life. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so I I'm big on age and establishing that. So you could say something like if, if you're open, I mean, I'm just just giving us free suggestion, you know, um, and I'm winging this, this is the improviser that comes up, but you could say something like, you know, David was 53 years old and he was an avid cyclist. It's something that he, he treasured five days a week. He would do the STP um, every year. He loved biking. But one day David gets sideswiped by a truck that doesn't see him. He's in the blind spot and now David is done and his brain has severe trauma. Mm -hmm. David's kids don't know where he's gonna be. If they're going to have their dad back, see what I'm doing? It's like I'm adding in just mm -hmm. more layers and textures to David and then saying, David is not alone. There are 50,000 people a month that get hit in across the globe. And we are here to solve that. So I agree with John. You like got to get that, that data stuff in there, but just a little more because right now I just had a, a guy named David. But if we can add just a little bit about David's life and his personality and, and the stakes that were involved in his own life, you're only further coloring that emotional ride to the audience. Just something to think yeah, about. It's, I love that you have a story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it. an, it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting perspective. So I actually started my career in nonprofits and in communications. Okay. And so telling these stories of individuals and how the organization changed their lives was what I was doing full time. Love it. Um, and it's really interesting now being in such a different role in a very technical situation with a lot of, you know, I have the spreadsheet with all the different variables and numbers, you know, I spent a lot of time in that more technical space. And so kind of merging those two worlds, it can sometimes be a challenge to find the right balance of the, the emotional connection but hey, also there's a really great investment here, you know, and, and trying to find that balance. So I think these are good conversations and good to, good to keep practicing because I could tell you 20 minutes about these stories and the people we know, um, but there's going to be other investors in the room who are going to say, okay, I got it. Patients care. Is this a business, right? So trying to find trying to find that balance um, when you yeah. have a broad audience. <laughs> Excuse which, me. which is why Does. we were talking about the um <coughs> do your research on the audience as, as much as you can ahead of time so you come in at the right angle mm -hmm. i'm yeah. so sorry i've got dust attacking my throat i hear you <coughs> excuse me i hear you caitlin what i did though was what 15 seconds right and so so i'm just saying is that you don't have to have this epilogue this this giant odyssey story about a person that's 20 minutes long you don't. And so the more you practice storytelling, the better you get at knowing when to pull what sense and what emotion and what background of, of a character who's really lived through this thing and whatnot. 
because you're right, you have to get to the investment. You've got to show it's a business, but it doesn't take that much to really like, ooh, heartstring them, heartstring pull them. Okay, Alexandra. Alicia has a question. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, and on that, that note, um, <clears throat> and thank you, Melissa, for the presentation, appreciate it. Mm. The pulling of the heartstrings, over and over, 24, 50 people pulling on your heartstring, pulling on your heartstring, play it, and eventually you peace out. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and I wonder, John, and anybody else who's, who's done these um, events, I've never done an event like this. And so I'm, I immediately start thinking, well, what's my strategy? What's, or what's going to be my tactic? Am I in the middle? Am I at the beginning? Am I at the end? Right. And that story that I tell is is potentially going to change on the fly, depending on where I'm at in that and, order. Right. Because you're going to have a lot why, more to pull on in the beginning. That's why you know? I randomize the speaking order, because people strategize like you're doing. And that's not helpful for the investor to understand the story. It's a it's a gaming the system thing. So you will be randomized in your order. Just be aware. aware so you won't that. know when you're coming on. You, you won't know. But you can still do, you can still change your story. You still can practice. So, things. so John, <sighs> then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that everybody's trying to pull that heartstring. We're all going to try to pull harder than everyone else in the competition. We want to well, be the one remembered. Doesn't well, that get the exhausting? Ones, the ones that are here in the room are the ones that are hearing the story, and the other ninety percent are not here and they're not going to actually do that. And so um, the reason we're talking about these things now is because people don't do an effective job of the sales task. They do the data task and talk about their product. And so we're trying to get them so they do the sales task. Now, um, I can tell you there's a bunch of people that are presenting companies, which I have, no matter how much the baby is crying, I don't care. Um, that's that's not my problem, <laughs> right? Um, and right. So so there's going to be only a few that really motivate me. And I me. see, but I'm that not, makes I'm not the sense. one that you're going to be talking to, right? You're talking to the 40 investors, and some of them are going to lean in, and some of them are not going to care. And 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 that resonance is back down to what Caitlin was talking about earlier about uh, understanding the audience and understanding what they know and where to come from figure out which character to put on stage because that's the character that aligns with the group and what the group is invested in before. And, and you're peppering stories too. So you're, Alicia, you're not going to be telling every single one of your stories at the beginning because you're right. You'll put, right. Them in the fetal, you'll put them in the fetal position and we don't want that either, right? But you right. have to know who your audience is and when you're at different points in the audience. So you might have a, a presentation where your first story is going to speak to everybody. It's the oxytocin story. It's, it's setting up the problem. But then as you're going into your deck and you start talking about the technology that you do and a discovery that you had that you made, that's a different story. And and if you tell that the CTOs and the IT people in the room, you're going to want to make sure that that story is going to speak to them more to back up that portion of your deck, right? You're not going to come in and because they're going to be very data oriented. So they're going to want to hear maybe that moment that the scientists discovered that you were on the right track. And I'm not going to tell a story right now, but do you see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. as you're getting into the technology, the story that's supporting the data and the data supporting the story is a tech story now. So with, with 60 seconds, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think I, know, I, I, I can answer my own question. You Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let, yeah. let's, let's go there though. With 60 seconds, how many of them would you spend on storytelling? To to total out of the 60. One, a tiny one. And then, I mean, I, everyone's different, but I mean, 60 seconds is not a lot. That's meaner than 99. I can, but even <laughs> in 99, we have one core and then we're moving through. I'm going to, I'd love to show you one. Would you guys like to see one that we do in 99? Do you want to see one or not? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. Please. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So this is, this is one. Um, and Sharon came to me really late in the competition. I just really love what she did, but like, 
this was her story fruition. I'm going to show you. Let me do a, I almost left the room. Don't want to do that. Uh, let's see. I want the sound. And this is 99 seconds. And I want you to listen for how much this woman gets in in 99 seconds as she's sprinkling in business facts about her company. Okay. So this is, uh, you can see, go love yourself. Okay, here we go. Loveyourselffox.com. Sharon, take it away whenever you're ready. All right, fantastic, thank you. So Sharon is 32 years old and she's had it. She feels like she's too young to run out, yet here she is on her own personal hamster wheel of hell. She pours her coffee long before the sun rises and barely even notices when the sun has set. Her anger, depression, and anxiety are through the roof. She pops Xanax to make it through the morning and Ambien to make it through the night and she's never felt more alone. She knows that life can be more beautiful than this and she knows that something's gotta change. Have you ever felt like this? Have you ever scrolled through Facebook or Instagram feeling pangs of envy thinking, I wish I could do cool shit like that, or man, it must be nice. I wish I could take a break. That's where Go Love Yourself comes in. For a monthly subscription, I send you a toolkit to help you on your journey. You'll get transformational self-help books, journaling prompts, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and join a community of like-minded people who realize that there's more to life than the grind. What started as a humble social media campaign has raised some serious attention, including unprompted unboxings from Ariana Huffington, Good Morning America, and most recently, we were named a top self-care strategy by Oprah Magazine. We're building a community that's empowering the calm, empathetic leaders we desperately need today and setting the stage for the empowered and enlightened leaders we even more desperately need tomorrow. I'm looking for investors and advisors who can help me to grow this powerful little community that I've built into a transformational platform that will change the lives of millions of women across the globe. I'm Sharon, the founder of Go Love Yourself, and I'm standing in front of you two years later, proof that this works. Sharon is calm, journaling with Earl Grey each morning, and meditating with chamomile each night. Thank you, and I hope you'll give us your vote. Great job, Sharon. So, so good. All right, we are taking... Okay, I gotta stop him from talking. Hang on. Ah! Hang on. I lost my mouse. Okay. So that's a quick pitch, right? And she's really in those in these little quick pitches. It's more of that high level, like the big picture of what she's doing. But she got in a lot of information. And did you notice how clean her slides were? But a three minute pitch, she's got to be expanding even more now on the business side of it, the science of the business, you know, the size of the market and whatnot. Um, looking back at that, I think that we could have added a couple of those things, but she did come to me 24 hours before the competition, <laughs> but she ended up winning. Like she, she got investors from it and she ended up winning, uh, the competition. I think she took 70% of the votes because everyone was like, that go love yourself was so, you know, easy to understand. You know, so um, I just want to kind of show you like how much you can really get in in a short amount of time. And so by the way, how yeah. much of that was because of the slide that said it's been unboxed by by Erna Huffington and it's she's been on Oprah. Like that was essentially a proxy for eight of the 10 slides that would typically be <laughs> in I know. the deck and that we can just assume she's doing some of these other things and at least give her take Kitty for granted we should have another conversation. Well, you know, what's hilarious though, is that she, like, I'm like, as we were finishing the first conversation, I was like, so have you had any like traction? Like, tell me real quick before we sign off. She's like, oh yeah. Uh, Good morning, America, HuffPo and Oprah. I'm like, are you kidding me? You've got to get that in your deck. Right. But the way she controlled it, I love how she did, did the slide because that was also very tactical on her. She, she had the slide come up and she, she pressed it to show you what to read. So she was in good control of how she delivered that slide as well, which is another thing. When you have a lot of slides, sometimes people will want to do with their technology, they get to the technology and they want to show you like the different phases, but they throw the whole thing up at once. The whole thing's up at once. And that's when we go into the fetal position and we get overwhelmed. And as that one gentleman said, I'm out, I'm not listening. He just lost me. Where you can take some animations and then control how you're delivering the data so that it keeps us, keeps the train on the tracks. Um, so do try to pay attention to that. Like take a step back when you're looking at your slides and go, am I gonna overwhelm them? And if the answer is maybe, then you are. So what can you do to clean that up? Can you, can you reanimate it? Can you take stuff out? Can you make, oh please, is one slide really supposed to be two or three? I see that a lot too.
I'll see people doing go to market and uh, traction at the same time. And those are two different things. So make sure you're also doing that, that you're, you're sharing the data cleanly and concisely. I think Carlos had something that he wanted to share. Carlos? Uh, thank you, uh, Melissa. Uh, some years ago, I was in Silicon Valley for a while. And I, I forget exactly how this goes, but I ran into a woman who was in charge of a, of a storytelling group, much like you. But she was helping really large companies to make presentations that were effective. Mm -hmm. And so she was hired by a company and they were going to make a presentation to a, you know, 10 times bigger company. And her team, which is more than just her, were working on it. And it included, you know, uh, you know, good posture, looking at the, at the audience properly, all, you know, all the things you need to do in 60 minutes, you know, worth of a presentation. And the CEO of the company was just getting so frustrated. And he finally pulled her over and said, look, we got to stop. You know, we make real stuff here. And you guys, and they really were, they're, they're Hollywood types. I mean, they worked in theater, they worked in commercials, they worked on television. And you're, you're, you don't make stuff, you don't know stuff. And so she just said, okay, you can get, you can fire us, I don't care. But let me tell you something. What we do when we do it well, people will pay for it. And when they leave our, our presentation, they will remember us not just for five minutes, they'll remember us for five years that they had a good time, that they learned something, that they saw something that they hadn't imagined before. And with yours, they're not, they're gonna forget it in five seconds after they spend a whole hour, if they, can if they can tolerate it with you. So, you know, it's just the power, you know, her story mm -hmm. of, you know, why you wanna tell a story and why you wanna be an effective presenter you know, to the best you can, as opposed to, yeah, you know, we want to be, you know, we got numbers, we got numbers, we got product photos, we got, you know, section drawings and so forth. The reality is, you know, it's just, she said, no one's going to care about that. They're going to forget you. You got to do better. That's it. That's a great story. I mean, and it's, uh, I concur. And I think there's a couple other storytelling coaches out there in the audience. They're probably going, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> because they're going to remember your story that's associated to the brand, which is what the data is all about. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, uh, I've never forgotten that story. We had a gentleman last month at Founders Live. He didn't win. He didn't win, but that's okay. Uh, we did his 99 second and he's, he's there's, I, we're getting a lot of, um, well, maybe because of COVID, but we're getting a lot of like, I don't know what to call it, death tech. Is it got a term? But it's, it's, you know, it's like preserving memories of someone, ordering uh, cemetery plots online, uh, there's just a, uh, 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 if you die early, make like EasyNet. I love EasyNet. Erin McCune, she's with SAC. Uh, she and I worked together um, and formulated her core story for Wishin. It's a powerful story. And she's, you know, if someone dies early, those that are left behind have to clean up the mess and the death business is busy and, and you can't even get photos off of their Facebook because you don't know the password. So Erin lived that and she created EasyNet because of it. So she tells that story now, which is really cool. Um, but the gentleman uh, last month, he, he all he's an Amazon exec starting this thing and he all, all data, it was all data. And he, I said, so tell me, so I, I think I get what you're doing. You're like preserving memories for people so that when they're gone, they're still there. Yeah. He's like, yeah. I go, well, how did the, how did you get there? He's like, well, my dad died when, you know, 18 years ago. I'm like, hang on. Tell me about that. And he tells me the story. Uh, we started his story at the cemetery, looking at his dad's gravestone. And his wife asks him, tell us a story about your dad. And I got nothing. And that's when I realized. And then he had these beautiful photos of, it's Juan Mendina, if you want to look him up. Um, he, he took this 99 second video. We put music underneath it. And then he started sending it out to uh, potential investors. And uh, he closed his first round in five days at 40% higher than his ask, using a very short 99 second with really well done, beautiful slides, easy to follow, emotional, and boom. Um, he was able to scale this effort, um, all from the Founders Live pitch. So go on. 
Tyler, the, 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 the beauty of using video and some, did, are there people out there that are using video to, to grab uh, attention to your investors? Hang on, I'm gonna change my view so I can see everyone. Gallery, nope, that's the- Well, I think all of us have to for SAC, right? Oh, you okay. Don't, you don't have to, but there's the opportunity and oh, okay. us to post one. And I would encourage you to not use that as a place to store a pitch, but to either do something that is hard to talk about dynamically. Like, you know, if you have a technical presentation where you don't want to actually um, do a live tech demo, you can put your tech demo there. But I would suspect that a, you know, a reputation check and team story in more detail to get a sense of the people would be a better thing to put in that um, video. Mm. Okay, so that's not people, the one minute people, pitch. No, the one minute pitch is in person or, or in Zoom. We're going to do those live. And part of the reason we do live is for people to get a sense of the speaker, right? Uh, you, you watch me scratch my head and you have opinions about that. And you, and you don't get that out of the video for some reason. They're buying the, the CEO and the presenter too. Yeah, yep. so being dynamic sincere, genuine, relatable. That's why please rehearse when you do these. Rehearse them, know them backwards and forwards. I'm constantly walking around with my own storytelling, recording myself, listening to it on my headset over and over and over again. And, and I also recommend not reading your scripts. Like if you rehearse it enough, your, your, your slide should just act like a cue card. You know exactly what you're going to say. Just know it, know it, know it, know it, because you will come off much more, I don't know, relatable, uh, char you know, mag more magnetic. Anyone can read a script. Stand out. Rise above. Memorize your deck. Know it. Backwards and forwards. Um, if I took one slide and I said, what would you say on this slide? You could do it. You wouldn't be like, oh, God, I, I can't remember. That's like uh, the seventh paragraph. Right? So one of the things that I, I like to suggest to people is uh, Ignite Seattle is a program where it's death by PowerPoint as entertainment. Yep. Um, tw 20 presentations, 20 slides per presentation, 15 seconds per slide, auto advance. And what it forces you to do is, this is a five minute pitch. Um, what it forces you to do is to do sound bites. Right, so you have a picture, two words, and a sound bite, and you get to do that 20 times. And now you can do the Lego thing and mix and match the sound bites and tell a better story in your regular pitch because you have the working components from the Ignite. I bet if you tried to write out 20 sentences, maybe 40 sentences, that was your pitch that fit into an Ignite format, it would change your perspective of your pitch. I actually did an Ignite Seattle. Um, I loved it. I loved the format. It was really pushing how you have to, like John just said. And my talk was a mental health talk about OCD. And um, I had to drop in a lot of numbers. I was, it was dropping, but I did it completely through the story of my journey with my daughter going through an intensive outpatient uh, program. And um, yeah, it's freeing. It's super freeing when you know you don't even have to click. It's gonna go, so you have to be totally knowing where you're at, and you can. And you, you know, you have a little screen in front of you, and big screens behind you. And again, all the slides. If you want to look it up, it's it's um, it's on my thing. Uh, I, put, I put the link for Ignite Seattle in the chat. Yeah. Three little dots on the bottom of your chat, and if you click that, you can save your chat. And there's a bunch of notes in there that are probably useful. I, I absolutely love that. But yes, it's a great point. Your five minutes should be run just like that. Or it could so, be. So, should be. Done. <laughs> bring up, bring up. so you told the story earlier about Sarah, right? right? right. And, and what, what it was like facing ovarian, ovarian cancer diagnosis. And, and that story, we remember. We remember. But, but we don't, we don't necessarily remember what, what company that was related to or what the product or solution was. Or, or like, like you told, told the story of the vet and, and the challenges being able, being able to get into, into the business, but it, but it didn't totally like click how that related to lawyers and AI. AI. So, so can you, can you speak, speak a little bit to 
when, when you have a really memorable case study, but weaving that into the actual business and product pieces so, so that it's not just your story that's memorable. Right. Great point. Your sound was doing something funky on my side. Was anyone hearing a, a, a robotic sound? Okay. Yeah. I don't know what that was. Um, are, do I sound like that? Am I sounding okay? You're okay. I'm okay. Okay. I don't know what happened, Caitlin, but it's okay. We got you. Um, again, yeah. And so when I'm doing the, when I did the doctor data, I couldn't remember the name of the company and I didn't really want to expose him to. So I wanted to kind of keep that one anonymous because in many ways that presentation was, I thought, a swing and a miss. And, and I didn't want to, so that's why you don't remember that particular brand. I did say it at the end. I just say, but it doesn't have to be that way for Sarah. At XYZ Pharma Company, we are reducing the, 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 the road that a typical ovarian cancer patient would have to go down. I did get a little loose on that. That's on me um, because I really was trying to, in my first story, really try to show you the character and their plight and how they would come in. Now, to answer your, your question, though, is that when you're starting to introduce yourself again, you're going to be showing, you're going to be showing the graphs. Every every slide, you know, put your logo, like have your logo in there, so that people are seeing and reading, but not, you know, not upstaging it. But you want to keep saying like and and, and repeating your company's name. So when you're getting into the hero part, the technology, you know, your company is brain space. So at brain space, we are changing the way that brain trauma happens. And then you start doing some drama or some, some data. And then you could be saying brain space knew that when those 50 million people were affected, that this was the other outcome, blah, 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 blah. So brain space is changing the way that brain trauma is being addressed. Okay. So you want to say your name in the story a lot, as well as have like my, my deck has my little comedy and tragedy on a lot of slides. Cause I want people to remember it. It's branding. That answer that help. One of the pro one of the great things about brain space is it's two words we know and you put them together and we still know them. So you can say that a little bit faster. But when we have people who have these uh, very yeah. uh, un unusual names that aren't part of our already existing dictionary and then they lower their voice and they look down and say the name of their company, um, <laughs> it's really hard for us to remember what that was because we couldn't even hear it and so uh, i want you know as basic mechanics for you to put spaces around the name of your company and to lift up your voice and speak louder when you say the name of the company because i have like james winard has visibility right yeah. i'm, I'm going to have a really hard time with that name right because it's got no vowels in it and now i'm struggling and then it's not going to all mush together and so um, if you have a name that I'm not going to get because it's not in my pre-existing dictionary in my head, then give me some brain space for me to listen to that name. Yeah, great point. And, and then you're, you're touching on something uh, about just your presentation skills, right? Like I was working with a young man today and he's got a low voice and I don't know what he tries to People mumble it. And like you said, his name. I'm like, whoa, sit up. Let's get the diaphragm up. You got to breathe. You have to say your name very carefully and you can't almost throw it all. Right. So the way you are presenting, you've got to be on a little bit more. You might feel like you're over enunciating, but it's okay. Um, so just be aware. And again, you know how you learn that? Record yourself. Watch yourself do your presentations. If you're not doing that, you're really missing out on an amazing opportunity. I personally love Soapbox. I think it's a great app. Um, you can have two screens. I can be looking at the camera and I'm looking at the camera, watching myself as a presenter as my screen is over to the left and I'm showing slides. And then when I package it up, I can actually manipulate it so that it's me at the beginning, then it's me with my slides, then it's just maybe just my slide. And then I come back and then it's just me. And so you can kind of like watch to see how your presentation is probably being viewed. Where, how do you sound? Are you mumbling? Are you making assumptions? Did you forget to say your name? <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a lot of little things that can take the train off the track. So rehearse. Say the name of that again. Soapbox. 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 And it's, and it's owned by Wist, Wist, Wistia. Um, I personally, because I love it, 
I mean, you can, it's free. You can have a free version. You can do a little thumbnail. I, I just love it. I use it all the time, but I actually pay $300 for the whole year because I actually am downloading MP4s and I'm using them in a lot of my marketing. So if, if it's something we're using a lot of video, I think I check it out. I like it. I see Alexandra has a question. Yes. Uh, there's a couple of questions, but yes, we did talk a lot about it because um, I was told that over 90% of investors uh, who will be listening to our presentations are have background in tech. And so I'm just wondering about this whole emotional presentation, how much they're going to respond to that. Is it the same way? Because um, how much, how emotional can you get to? Yeah. <laughs> how emotional is too much? Let's say. So this, this is what's, what I'm curious. That's the first question. Okay. Um, it doesn't have to be a ton. It doesn't, it's a great question because you're right. And if it's a, again, know your audience, know who's out there, yes. but just setting up just a little emotion at the beginning is great. And then maybe, maybe you, you're going to go all business and data until you get to a case study that's proving your technology and a little more emotion can come back. Right. So you're going to be, you got to be really strategic where your stories are falling what that story is about and what data is it representing. But every story will, it can't help it. It can't help but have some sort of emotion. There's an aha moment where like you realize this technology is working, right? You're not going to go. And then we realize that the technology was working. You want to like, you want to show us what that excitement was maybe when those discoveries were made. Um, I just don't believe that any presentation just has to be data. Let me read it. Let me read it. Let me read it. Let me drone. Let me drone. Let me drone. You're going to bore them. You don't I have the, the other problem, actually. I don't have all that data. <laughs> I have a lot of emotion, but so that's what I'm trying to make sure that I relate to the majority of the audience. And um, I can tell stories, 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 but I know that what they want to hear is a lot of data. So which is the other? They want to hear enough data that they have belief in your credibility. Exactly. And you don't need to go into the gory detail of the data until you're doing the due diligence. You can dangle the opportunity for more data in the due diligence after they've decided that you're credible. But if you present stories without grounding, you become not credible and then people stop listening. Yep, it's a balance. It's definitely a balance of left brain, right brain. So, you know, I talk a lot about, um, about getting people's attention and um, we had somebody who was uh, coming to SAC who was um, trying to do an app that gave you just-in-time babysitters. And the, the way that she got people's attention, you know, I, I can't get a babysitter, so I'll just use the app and I'll get a babysitter. The way she got people's attention is she came in onto the stage with her baby and the baby was fussing and um, she tried to give the pitch as though she had not been able to get the babysitter and trying to make that go. And that was so uncomfortable for the audience that they couldn't process what she said, even though it was pretty clear by the end that she had set that up intentionally and that it was designed as an intention getting device. The, she pushed it over the edge to the point where everybody was so uncomfortable that they were done with the conversation yep. right there. Right, and they, they did not listen to the rest of it. So that balance point is relatively narrow. Yeah, uh, don't can, get hokey. You yeah. want people to get uh, alert and attentive, but you don't really want them to squirm. Totally. And yeah, that, ugh, that makes me uncomfortable just even hearing it. Um, and also be careful of using acronyms and words. I, I see that a lot because you'll have a, a big, if you have a big room of people and you have that knowledge, of pow that power of knowledge, and you, you drop an acronym that you think everyone knows, you're taking people out. And here's what happens. They start to wonder what it stands for and they start to wander away from you. I call it the wonder wander. And so if you do something, spell it out at first and then later, just like a, like a legal doc. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll say it and then they'll say, from now on, we're not going to say your name. We're just going to call you client. Then I think it's cool, unless it's like a totally, like totally well-known acronym, like MSA. Most people would know something like that, but like um, MVP, people would know that. But but definitely be careful of, of, of doing that because you can take people out and even for a second. And if they're out because you didn't 
use your obligation to make sure you're choosing words that were clearly defined, um, you lose them. And then they got to jump back in and they'll be like, oh crap, how big was the market? I missed that because I didn't know what that word meant. <laughs> so That's uh, jump on a soapbox for a moment. Please. Um, I get to hear the word MVP often. And it came from Eric Ries, who wrote a book called The Lean Startup. And he used it two ways. The product that you have that meets product market fit or the smallest test that you can do that proves something that causes you to learn. Neither of those choices are what people use MVP for today. What they mean is my crappy version of my software that I haven't figured out whether anybody cares about it, but I believe it's really cool. And if you give me money, I'll make it better. That is not an MVP. And so when people say, we finished our MVP and now we just need to find customers, I'm like, I'm done with the conversation, right? So please don't use the word MVP. Talk. Talk about your customers. Talk about your engagement with your customers. Talk about how you may be prototyping things and engaging your customers with that prototype. But when you tell me MVP and I built an MVP and you didn't tell me anything about the customers that used it, um, all done. He's out. His train uh, is going south. So just to be <laughs> clear, I'm one of 40 people in the room. So there's 39 other people with different opinions on that. But uh, some of us are getting weary of MVP. Elizabeth just made a great comment that also acronyms can mean different things in different industries. So totally true. Totally true. So, yep, just be careful. I'm trying to think. There was another thing that came to my mind. It's gone. It's gone. Any other thoughts before we close up? We're a couple minutes from the end. I have another question. Sorry, I know uh, my company's name is very long. It's very difficult to pronounce and I'm pretty much done with it. I have a new name, uh, but I'm right in the middle of right now creating a profile and gosh, I mean, finishing up and everything. So it's like, I don't know. Do you have any suggestion? Because I do have a great catchy name for the company. <laughs> I would like to keep that long name for the product line because that really defines the product uh, we offer but I, it's just not going to go as a company name any further. So I don't know. I'm... What is it? I see it doesn't even fit. So Siberian poly polyprenals, polyprenals. It's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's descriptive name basically. And what well, is our, it? La our last um, company for SAC, they went through the competition um, with uh, digital proteomics as their name. And the day of the final event, they actually um, changed their name to Abtera Bio. And so uh, they, they found that, remember what John said is that week over week, you're making progress, right? You're testing out your ideas with customers. You're pitching to 40 other people and 40 uh, um, other companies. And if people are constantly saying, I don't know what's going on with your name, um, then that was enough feedback for them they had actually started before they joined us, but uh, on the transition plan, but they did change their name right up to the end. So it just seems like when it's an appropriate time to, to do it, you can say this company also known as. Yeah. Yeah. If you're having an instinct that it's too long and you have an instinct to change it, change it. Yeah, it's just because we did talk about your presentation to repeat name a few times, which is understandably was my company's name. It's really, really necessary, but it's, <laughs> it is something that's really bulky at this point. So I feel. So you see how your name is showing up? You want, you want your name to fit right yeah. into that spot. And if it goes too much past that spot, then nobody gets it. Right. So you only, you only have a little bit, right? So you can have other descriptive names as you know, blah, 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 colon, a long description, but blah, blah, blah is what you have to have. Because even Alexander's a long name. Isn't that weird? We actually have to think like that, right? We have to be like, how am I going to look in my Zoom box? But and it is from part Russia, of your brand. It's, 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 it's a Russian influence. We love long names. Beautiful it's name. Nice. I love it. <laughs> we go with as long as possible, so... <laughs> <laughs> and also when you're doing your presentations just you know a little you know keep a clean or an interesting background 
Um, I saw a woman that during rehearsals for Founders Live, um, she had been using a virtual background, but then in the actual show, she took it down and it looked like she was in a junkyard behind there. And it was very, 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 yeah. Good question, nice yes, because there are these virtual backgrounds. And I was thinking for these two names is to have the one that's right now and the one that's going to be. So they're sort of like connected on the background. I don't know. How well known are you as Siberian Paula Perver? The it's customers, well they do know, but it's all right. Like I said, we're going to keep it as yeah. a product line, so they will be able to find us. But it's for the investors and for the business relationships, I think we definitely should be. No, we, we're not in the big concern that, you know, we're not very well known yet. Yeah. 10 customers, 100 customers, 1,000 customers. I'm sorry? When you say we're known by our customers, 10 customers or 100 customers or 1,000 customers, how many people's brains do you Good have Good question, yes. They're, they're just uh, probably a few hundred, but yes, it's not it's not a huge number. Like I said, the Siberian Peripheral will stay as a product line, so there will be ability for anybody to find it. So if they're like looking for that, they will find us. But it's mostly like in the business relationships that we're not really, yeah. I didn't have a lot of exposure, so we don't have a lot of connections. It's okay, I can change it eventually. Uh, but it's just because I'm in the middle of a uh, sack right now. So, and I feel... There's a lot going on as an entrepreneur. And Caitlin just said, I can see her name. And mm -hmm. if you're in speaker view, I could see the whole thing. But if I'm in gallery view, it was polypura. And so it, just so you're aware of that. Um, yeah, so yeah. Melissa, where did it cut her off for her reference? Uh, it says Alexander McCarthy. So let me get back into gallery view. So right now I would only see Alexander McCarthy dash SIB because I'm in gallery. Um, I'm in speaker. And then when I go to gallery, I see uh, your name and then Siberian poly. And then it's dot that's dot. That's what I see too. Yep. Yeah. That's what I see myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I added mine in there just to see that it fit. Yeah. So I'm fitting. And you got John with Sack, and I see Snack Tech, Botegrity that people are starting to add. That's good. Um, yeah, check that out. See how you can make that fit. Visibility. Oh, that looks like a okay. license plate. Is it, is it <laughs> okay not to use last name in this? Here, since I have everything that long. What it's do you think, matter, John? I don't think it's necessary if you want to optimize you can optimize you can also put your name last and put company first and then yep. it sorts differently alexander m yeah mm -hmm. yep. yep and you know because your contact people, page will have some it. people go by alex even though they're female and some people Never. go by al even though they're alexandra so <laughs> um, there are other ways to cheat too yeah so um uh, the one thing that I want to make sure we emphasize before we call it the night is that really having a third person um, review your pitches and practicing your pitches really is going to make a difference for you. And we have one minute pitches in two weeks. And so really spend, spend not once or twice with somebody else, but 10 or 20 or 30 times with somebody over the next two weeks. Um, and go with different people and get feedback and do the practice on, again, maybe it's just the sound bites, maybe it's the three minute pitch, but get to the point where this flows naturally for you and that you're not reaching for things and pausing. Um, and when people give you feedback about, I didn't understand that, or that doesn't make any sense, maybe even preferably use some investor types or at least some entrepreneur types to get feedback. So you could do it with each other, by the way. Um, and you would benefit from that. So on that note, thank you for coming. Um, we will start our program of investor stuff uh, next week. We have a talk by Bob Crimmins on Thursday about the fundraising journey and his experiences with that. I urge you to um, engage in that. I think it'll be useful. Um, and if, I'm currently planning the September through November talks for um, SAC. Um, so if you have topics that you wish we dove deeper into, please send me a suggestion. And if you're at all interested in health or health-related stuff, talk to Elizabeth about her workshop series for APIS Health Angels, which starts on the evening of September 9th. Thanks for coming. <laughs>